and welcome to the MBOM podcast, where you'll learn to master the business of yoga. MBOM is a proud part of the Wander Barn Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Amanda Kingsmith. I'm a 500 hour registered yoga teacher, a yoga business coach, and a total business geek. Here at MBOM, you'll learn everything you need to know to create a sustainable yoga business by learning from myself and guests from around the world about how they built their yoga businesses and about how you too can become a successful yoga teacher, studio owner, and much more. All right, let's dive in. Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of the MBOM podcast. I am excited that you're joining me for today's episode of the show, as always. And today on the podcast, I am really excited to be joined by Dogmar Spremberg, Dogmar is a 500-hour ERYT and the founder of Montezuma Yoga in Costa Rica. And in this episode, Dogmar shares what brought her to Costa Rica 20 years ago, what it was like starting Montezuma Yoga, you know, way back before Costa Rica was the yoga yoga retreat destination that we know it to be now. She talks about how she pivoted her business and her studio during the pandemic, how she was able to create an online presence when she was previously always in person before, and then ultimately what has led to her closing down the studio. And we recorded this episode a couple of months ago when she was right in the process of you know, shutting everything down and offering her last classes. And now it's been a couple of months since that's happened. And obviously, that's a really big transition when you've run a business in a community and really built a community of yoga over the course of 20 years. So Dogmar shares, you know, what she's learned through this process, uh, through her career as a yoga teacher and studio owner, what's next for her and so much more. So this is a really, really wonderful episode. I hope that you enjoy and I'm really excited for you to listen. Before we get into it, just wanted to give a quick little shout out to the sponsor for this week's episode of the show, Offering Tree. You guys hear me talk about Offering Tree a ton on this podcast, and it's truly because I love the software and the people. One of the things that I really love about Offering Tree and working with them is that it's a team of entrepreneurs and a team of yogis and yoga teachers who are excited to listen to what other yogis, yoga teachers, and wellness entrepreneurs need out of their yoga businesses. And I think that there are, you know, lots of great software platforms out there. But when you sign up for another software, you don't sign up to be heard by the founders and the co-founders and the people on the team with what you need. And when you sign up for Offering Tree, you get that. So I'll tell you a bit more about them and why I love them later on in the episode. But for now, maybe go check them out, offeringtree.com forward slash MBM. All right, now let's get into the episode with Dagmar. Welcome to the podcast today, Dagmar. I'm really excited to have you here with me today. Thank you. I'm excited to have you be here too. And can you share with, with listeners where you're joining us from? I'm actually joining from Costa Rica in a very little town called Montezuma on the beach. It's the tip of the Nicoya Peninsula for those of you who have a little idea about Costa Rica. Very tiny little fishing village still. Yeah. And you've been based there for a while now, right? Yeah. I just had in November my 20-year anniversary. It's crazy how time flies. Yeah. No, that's amazing. That's incredible that you've been living in Costa Rica for so long. And I'm excited to hear all about how you got there and what you've been up to there, owning a studio, all that good stuff. But maybe let's back up a little bit. Can you tell me a little bit about your yoga journey and how you got into yoga? Yeah, sure. Um, Well, I left Germany in 1996 and I had no experience with yoga, but that was the big turning point in my life. I had just turned 30, funny enough, and I just left everything behind. I decided to move to LA and I left my husband, my job, my family and friends. I'd never been in LA. So I just feel like I just wanted to be as far away as possible. And uh, I ended up in LA and of course I was a little bit lost and I thought I had just done the biggest mistake in my life. And, uh, and I found yoga because of course LA, everybody was going to yoga and I was like, Ooh, what's this? And uh, I fell in love with it right away. 
Yeah. What was LA, like, what was the LA yoga scene like in like the nineties? It was amazing because there were very few studios. I lived in Beechwood Canyon. So the closest studio to me was uh, Larchmont, which then later on became, I think, also Yoga Works. So that was the only really big studio there. Anusara Yoga was big. So there was City Yoga on um, Fairfax in Santa Monica. There was the big studio in, um, in Venice. I think it was called Sacred Movement. So it was really amazing because we had access to all these wonderful teachers, you know, from Ashley Turner to Max Strom. I mean, there were so many like, you know, Kishan Shaw, like so many really wonderful teachers. And it really felt like community. And uh, that really changed. I mean, when I look at the yoga now, it's it's so different. So I feel very, very grateful that I had access to, yeah, this community from a very early time. Yeah, no, that sounds awesome and very different from, I don't know a lot about the LA yoga scene these days, but it sounds very different from what I do know about it. And I'm curious for you, as you were practicing, what was the like shift for you to get into actually teaching yoga? Oh, that happened way later. That happened when I finally moved to Costa Rica. And I think it was really a process. I, I mean, if I back off a little bit to me, what really yoga brought to my life was a softening because, you know, I came from Germany. I, you know, I was taught like you have to make things happen. And then I came to yoga. I had a lovely teacher. Her name is Christy Minorovich. And she was always talking about, you know, you got to, soften you got to think you know things will fall into place all the things that I never really heard before I was like what things don't fall into place right but it really worked and the more I did yoga the more things started to fall into place um so for me it was from the beginning not just the physical practice was really much more like a lifeline to really like a different philosophy encouraging me that actually was okay what I did and changed my life and the longing I had to find a different way of living. And so when I finally moved to Costa Rica, um, Elena Brower was my teacher in New York. Um, and uh, basically it was really like the manifestation of all the yoga. It was all of a sudden things really fell into place. Like I could have never planned it. And so to me, that was when the desire was born to share this with the world, because I was like, well, if it happens for me and if it works for me, then things really do fall into place when you do yoga. So it's always been like my angle on the yoga practice of like really practical, like, okay, how can I use the yoga to uh, live my life in a, in a more authentic way, in a, in a, yeah, in a more um, conscious way? And uh, yeah, in a different way than just focusing on anatomy or yoga um, philosophy or things like that. Yeah, no, I love that. And I'm curious, what did you live in the US for like the whole time between the time that you like until you moved to Costa Rica? No, I moved to LA in 96 and I was there three and a half years. And then I moved to New York because I was kind of done with LA. And so, you know, as things were falling into place, I ended up living in New York. And then I came to Costa Rica in December 2000, just on a vacation. Mm. And I had been to Montezuma already in 1991 from Germany with my ex-husband. And it was back then in 91, really like my dream life, what I had always dreamed of, like living under the palm trees, uh, in the jungle, in beautiful weather. And it always felt like, how am I ever going to do this? And then. Uh, in 1991, when I was in Montezuma, the first time it's like, you know, you see somebody living your dream and it still feels like, oh, it's not for me. But now I see what it looks like. You know, it's different than just a vision. So when I came back in 2000, I was sure I wanted to go back to Montezuma. I felt like this place was such a powerful place to me. And I came back and I met my ex-boyfriend who was uh, owning a hotel we fell in love I went back to New York and first it was just going back and forth between New York and uh, Costa Rica and that wouldn't be possible anymore these days but back in 2000 that was still possible and then September 11 happened and basically I wasn't in New York when it happened. We were actually in Morocco, craziest place to be in the middle of the desert when everything happened. 
But when I came back to New York in the beginning of October, my whole life was turned upside down. And it was, again, like a very, very clear sign, like, okay, this is it. Like, my next step is to move to Costa Rica and uh, see what happens. And this is, again, how I just, you know, followed the signs and left New York and ended up creating a life here. And I had already connected to Elena. She was my main teacher. I went to yoga like five days a week. And then I asked her if she wanted to come to Costa Rica to teach a retreat. And she wasn't as famous yet back then. So she was like, sure, let's do it. And the retreat was planned for November 2001, right after September 11. And she already had a big following. So she came in November. And then basically she was the one who pushed me into teaching because there was no yoga here in Costa Rica. Everybody thought I was crazy. Everybody was like, yoga, who cares? Let's party, right? And so <laughs> Elena came. <laughs> Elena came and she said, Dagma, I think you should start teaching yoga. And I was like, what, me? And she was like, sure, nobody does it. You love it. I know you're going to be an amazing teacher. So I'll just mentor you. And so she handed me the Anusara teacher manual and she said, keep the book, start teaching, I'll mentor you. And that's how I basically started with just a handful of people who were interested. So again, really amazing how, you know, I could have never planned this, how things just started falling into place. Yeah. And it's, it's so interesting to he just hear like Costa Rica 20 years ago, there wasn't <laughs> yoga. Cause I think that so many people now are like, oh, I want to go practice yoga internationally. I want to go on a yoga retreat. And I think Costa Rica is probably one of the top destinations that would come to mind for most people first. <laughs> Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about what it was like, you know, living in Montezuma and, you know, it's still a very, very small kind of surf town. So I would imagine it was, you know, quite small in the early 2000s when you were living there as well. And I'd love to hear like what it was like kind of starting to teach and, and bringing yoga to this community. It was very interesting because, of course, like I said, nobody really believed in yoga. Everybody was like, what's yoga? And, you know, we were like a handful of people who really pioneered the yoga scene here, you know. And Anusara Yoga, that was really amazing. Um, there were teacher, teachers from Anusara Yoga coming to Costa Rica. There was a studio in San Jose who was hosting them. And so a few of us who were in these beach towns... Um, always went to San Jose. And again, there was this really strong feeling of community and um, yeah, training and continuous education. And uh, John Friend came to Costa Rica several times and really like senior teachers, Lois Nesbitt. And uh, that was really, really great. And so we would always meet, know each other, send each other people. And uh, yeah, in the beginning, I was teaching two times a week and I was happy if like 10 people would show up in my class. But I was also happy because I was very nervous about, you know, teaching because I started teaching before I had my certification. I had to go back to New York and find a teacher training for a month that I could take. You know, back in the day, it wasn't so easy. And uh, yeah, I'm very grateful for that. that We really had this feeling of community and grateful to Anusara Yoga because they even sent a senior teacher once a year to Costa Rica and then that person would go to all these places where we Anusara inspired teachers were, and they had to watch our class and certify that we were allowed to call ourselves Anusara inspired teachers. And um, because I had the space in the hotel of my boyfriend then, and I created the studio Montezuma Yoga, I invited teachers from New York and from LA for retreats. And that was really wonderful because I could continue my education for free, basically, because I was hosting these people. And that's how it started. Like Elena, I think, came three times and brought retreats. And then she told other people. And so, you know, I started really creating a name. And um, yeah, and had really, from my anger to Kundalini to like Hatha Yoga, like all kinds of different teachers coming and hosting retreats. Because it wasn't so many places yet where you could go. So that was really fortunate as well for me. Yeah, that's that's really awesome to hear. And so did you run Montezuma Yoga out of the same space like up until you just made a shift recently? Yes, I ran it there for 20 years. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And yeah, so you run. Uh, I'd love to just like hear like running a studio space for 20 years is incredible. Like I'd love to just hear about that. Yeah, it was quite a journey. But like I said, you know, the beauty was that there were not really any rules. I mean, I think running a yoga studio in New York is probably much, much harder. I had this space that was uh, connected to the hotel of my boyfriend then. And then he really, he wasn't a yogi. So he really basically let me do whatever I wanted to do. So I was very free. I at first for the first couple of years, I taught all the classes. And then things were growing. Then I brought guest teachers. And my vision was always to create a sanctuary for community. And I had the local community, but there were not many people, maybe like five, six, seven people who would come regularly. So there was already tourism growing and and people started coming. I just created the sanctuary with this beautiful exchange of teachers coming to host retreats then my own classes. And there was really um, a beautiful sense of community. And it was a very old space, you know, so other hotels then created these amazing Balinese fancy yoga shalas, you know, and my place was just this like space for like 20 people. But it was so cute because you could tell there was so much like energy in it. And people would always come and be like, oh my God, this is like the most beautiful yoga shala ever. And I would look at my shala and be like, really? <laughs> You know, but it was just very typical and original and and really just a different time back then. And it's sweet. And people really felt the love that in there. And uh, yeah, and it changed in a sense that like the last couple of years, of course, things got a little bit more restricted with like, you know, having paperwork and stuff. So it was more tricky to find teachers who were resident teachers. And, you know, but still Costa Rica until recently was kind of loose and you could have guest teachers without a work permit and things like that, that would not be possible in New York or in Hamburg or in other places. You know, it's changing a little bit now that the market is so much bigger, but you know, it was, it was fun. I felt it was very free. I could really do whatever my vision was. My vision was always to have great teachers that would stay long-term. I was never into just hiring all these teachers for like a month. I I had really like one teacher with me for like eight years. And the other teacher that's still with me right now is working for me since three years. So and that creates really community and family. And a lot of the places I see now in Costa Rica are just hotels offering yoga classes, but the yoga spaces are not run by people who are yoga teachers or studio owners. So they just basically offer their space. And then there's always fluctuating yoga teachers passing through and teaching some classes, but nobody really, you know, creates this family or this community. And I believe you can really feel the difference. And that's probably what people felt when they came to Montezuma Yoga. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that that's something that you is really important when you're running a studio. And I think it's, you know, something that if you were going to open a studio, maybe in like your local community, you would want it to feel very much like a family and have that, that vibe. And I think it's a little bit harder when you are maybe like in a tourist town where you have people coming and going. And then also in a country where, you know, there's lots of yoga teachers who want to you know, travel through Costa Rica or travel through Central America and teach yoga. And so they just want to come and they want to teach for, you know, a couple of weeks or something like that. It's Mm -hmm. like that kind of, obviously that's a really beautiful thing and and amazing to do, but can also kind of take away from this like community vibe that I think is so important when it comes to our yoga. Yeah. And I think the other really big difference compared to probably a studio in New York is that you have a very fluctuant clientele, you know, like I think if I look at my friends in Germany or in America and they have yoga studios, it's like you have your regulars and you work differently because you have these people following you for years. And so then in Montezuma, you have tourists and they come to one class, three classes, five classes. If you're lucky, sometimes they stay for a month, but every day you have new people, which in the beginning was very challenging because you know I would plan a class and be like okay today I'm gonna do arm balances and for sure five people would walk in and be like hi I've never done yoga before and I'd be like okay I guess we're not doing arm balances today (laughs) so um, (laughs) 
but it's really nice too because I feel also it's really great because it really got me into this, uh, you know, improvising and really um, being able to teach such a variety of people, which really helps me now in the retreats that I'm teaching because really everyone is welcome and I know how to let people modify. And I've also met so many amazing people. And sometimes like years later, they would write to me and be like, oh, um, I took a yoga class with you like five years ago and actually I became a teacher since, na, 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 na. And you're like, wow, like you never know how you touch people's lives, right? With just maybe three classes, you, you met them. Hey, yoga teachers. We're just taking a quick break from the podcast to talk about Offering Tree. Today, I want to talk about the difference between Offering Tree and Acuity. They're both software platforms that you can use to schedule classes and private lessons online. But my favorite choice is Offering Tree, and I want to tell you why. First of all, you can customize the look and feel of your signup experience with Offering Tree. You can add unique photos and customize the page layout for your homepage and any landing page. With Offering Tree, you can also offer pay what you can pricing options or sliding scale pricing. You can't do that with other platforms. Offering Tree is also much more user friendly for both your customers and you to set up. You could sign up for Offering Tree today and start scheduling classes that are integrated with Zoom in just 30 minutes. And finally, Offering Tree is so much more than just a scheduling tool. With just one login and just one monthly fee, you can host your website, schedule classes, sell on demand content, and send your students email and text messages. Here's what Aaron, an Offering Tree user, said about the platform. I feel like I can do so much in one place with Offering Tree. Their monthly fee gets you what other companies are charging, like 10 bucks a piece or more. When you're running your own business, it's so important to keep costs low while also using tech that you trust. So instead of paying for a website and a scheduling system, you can do it all in one place with Offering Tree. Offering Tree plans start at just $22 a month, and I'm excited to partner with Offering Tree to offer MBM listeners a special discount. You can get 15% off an annual plan or 50% off the first three months by heading to offeringtree.com forward slash MBO. Once again, that's offeringtree.com forward slash MBO. All right, now back to the show. You've obviously made some pivots over the last little bit. I'd love to hear a little bit about like why you decided to pivot Montezuma Yoga over over the last couple of months. Well, you know, if you don't make those decisions yourself, the universe kind of steps in. I have to admit that it wasn't really my decision. <laughs> I have to say for the last two years since Corona, a lot of things has shifted and it wasn't already not really fully in alignment with the location, like the hotel. Well, first of all, the hotel belongs to my ex-boyfriend and we broke up already uh, in 2006. But we kept, you know, the business together. I was hosting retreats there and people would stay in the hotel. But definitely like our vision for the place was more and more going in different directions. Let's put it that way. And I wasn't really feeling 100% in alignment with the place anymore. But then, you know, every time I came to my studio, it was my studio. And I was like, okay, but this is my sanctuary. And, you know, I had this beautiful yoga cat for 10 years. We called him Sylvester. He was like really the soul of the yoga studio. He's famous. People always took pictures of him. And I was very attached to, you know, I cannot just leave here because I, I don't I don't know any other space where I would want to be. The location was perfect. So then this summer, uh, when I was in Europe teaching retreats, all of a sudden part of the hotel was torn down. Uh, due to some just laws and being in the 150 meter zone. And um, and that was a shock for me because it was in Europe and I was like, what? Like, I didn't even really know what was going on. And the owner didn't tell me anything. And he said it just happened all very quickly. So the lack of communication was really a little hurtful to me. And I was like, wow, like after 20 years, you know, I was still hoping though or thinking, oh, well, I come back and maybe I'll work around it. And then my cat died, the yogi cat. And basically he actually, yeah, he actually I'm so sorry. Thank you. Thank you. You know, he died, interestingly enough, two days before the hotel was demolished. And he was already sick last year. He had like kidney failure. So it 
the cat, I, I kind of like, he was sick last year when I was gone and I came back and I kind of like lifted him up and picked him up and put him on a special diet. But I knew he was fragile. And when I left in July to Europe, I kind of had a feeling like I might not see him, you know. So the cat died. Two days later, the hotel building was torn down. And I was at the same time in Italy at this beautiful retreat center called Mandali, where I'm teaching. And it was really bizarre because I happened to teach together with the woman who was my teacher for eight years, who lives now in France. So we were teaching the retreat together. And here I am in this gorgeous place that shares my vision, doing what I love to do. And I could have not been in any better place to receive these news, right? To receive the news of my cat that I love so much and the space. And again, it's like, wow, I mean, the universe takes care if you're willing to see all the little signs, right? And I was like, well, this is the place I love to work. This place is an alignment. This place, I feel community. You know, I love the other teachers and definitely Costa Rica has not been in in alignment i've just been holding on and so yeah with uh you know with all that going on i just you know decided that it's really time to let it go that i wouldn't want to come back and basically have people walk by some rubble of like the torn down hotel building in order to come to yoga so it was very like in my face like okay come on dogma it's time to it's time to move on and it's time to let go so yeah, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like it's almost like the cat knew, right? Like that. Totally. It was like time to close a chapter. Totally. And I'm really grateful to him Mm. for, you know, passing because I I know I would have never been able to let it go with him still being in the space. That would have really broken my heart. And uh, I really saw that as really a big sign of like he kind of felt it. He knew it was time to let go. He let go the space was taken and uh yeah and i was not here i think it would have been really much harder for me to witness it being here seeing all this happening so again i was very grateful to be surrounded by my friends and community and doing what i love to do in a gorgeous place like italy and uh, yeah and uh, and then i had the time to really grieve the end of the 20 year cycle while I was still in Europe and people, you know, at some point I was like, okay, I'm just going to make it public. I posted it on social media and I got so many amazing messages and, and comments from people who were like telling and sharing how the space has touched their lives. And it was really amazing. I mean, what a beautiful gift to know that you've created something that has touched so many lives over 20 years and that was very helpful to let it go yeah absolutely yeah that's you know obviously it's so sad to close a door on something especially something that you built and created and nurtured over 20 years which is you know a long time to be running a business but also what a beautiful way to kind of close that chapter and so with Montezuma Yoga are you you're continuing to run classes still out of Montezuma just like kind of in a different way yeah until the end of the year so basically what I did then I I was offered another space in like a very beautiful fancy modern hotel and I was like oh this is perfect see like you know one thing closes the next door opens right away so while I was still in Germany I committed to start um, bringing Montezuma yoga to this new space and uh, I was very excited about the collaboration and um but when i arrived back in montezuma and started i could also tell that again things were not really in alignment i mean they're very corporate um, business and for me after 20 years of really running my own business with my vision and my trust in my open heart i could not really fit myself into somebody's really in my opinion strict concept you know and then right now we also have all these laws you know things are changing and mandates i don't even want to go into it but like it felt really like a lot of pressure on like running the studio in the new space and committing to the contract and i could just tell all of a sudden i had this anxiety and i was like how am i gonna make this work to make everybody happy and then one evening i was going for dinner with a friend and um told him like 
the whole story, how everything had happened. And he looked at me and he said to me, uh, well, how about I change your perspective? And I said, what? And he's like, well, you've been serving this community for 20 years. How about you take a break? And I was like, oh, a break? And my whole body was like, yes. You know, and you, you know, that's so beautiful when you have good friends and they hold the mirror. And I was like, you are so right. I mean, I, why am I not allowing myself just simply a break? It doesn't have to be forever. And he said to me, and that's a very interesting point. I think it's like, okay, you have been Mrs. Montezuma Yoga for the last 20 years. And it's very natural. We do something for 20 years. And then we think, you know, oh, this ends. I'll just keep doing what I know, what I'm doing and bring it to the next place without ever taking a break and seeing if maybe something else is required. And I became totally aware of the whole process. And I was like, wow, actually, I really do want to take a break and I deserve to take a break. And I'm teaching online and I'm teaching retreats, but I really want to focus on the things that are creating so much joy and that are in alignment with my vision and that, you know, that feel authentic to me where I don't have to make myself small to fit somewhere in or like, you know, bend myself, but just to really be me. And so, yeah, it's a big step, but uh, again, amazing how the universe shows you when you're open to see the signs and, you know, the right people show up in the right moment and hold you the mirror or ask you the right question. And so from that place, I, I then wrote my letter to her the next day and said, I'm really sorry. I, uh, I commit to stay until the end of the year, but I think as of January, I'm not continuing any public classes. And, uh, and she, you know, I think when you're really sure about something, she really felt it and she felt it wasn't against her or her business. It was really just the decision to just listen to my heart, you know, and that, you know, it, I needed to probably commit to the time there to realize, oh, actually, that's not what I really want right now, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that and just for sharing that so like authentically and candidly, because I think that it's hard to let things go, especially things that we've worked with and worked on for so long. And I think it's, you know, just a sign of like, you know, everything kind of happens for a reason. Right. And it's like all these things happened and then it's like, okay, well, there's another space. Like maybe that's kind of like divine intervention. Like I'm meant to continue this and then becoming clear on the fact that like, okay, this isn't actually aligned. Like maybe it's time to really close this chapter on, you know, owning a studio in this space. And there's a lot of like relief that can come with that, like making that decision, but then also grieving for the fact that, you know, you've done this like beautiful job of building this community over this last 20 years. And it's hard to just be like, okay, we're done with this now. Right. So um, I just want to acknowledge that and honor that. And I think that that's a really beautiful transition that you're going through. And so I, I'm curious you know, with your break, like, do you have a sense for, you know, what's next for you? Like, are you going to stay in Montezuma or are you feeling called to other places or are you just kind of like taking a moment to just pause and figure out what's next? Well, first of all, thank you for acknowledging that because I think that's always such a big part and even for ourselves to acknowledge what we've done because we're always so focused on the next thing, the next thing, you know, and of course, the universe is always tempting. So again, already people are calling me and like, hey, if you need a space, like you could come and teach here. And I'm like, no, I'm taking a break. Thank you. And then the next person like, how about, you know, so it's, uh, it's I'm smiling at it now because I'm, I'm really in this really clarity point right now. So I know I really, really do want to take that break. I, my heart is very much in Europe as well. I mean, I am German and I, I always teach retreats in Europe. Right now, it's a tricky situation to be in Europe and it's not easy to travel and teach retreats. But I know that will always be a big, big part and one of the things I love to do most. In the meantime, I'm teaching online. I started teaching online um, in March 2020, right when the whole pandemic started. And I've really built a community online. And of course, it's not as big anymore as in the beginning. But it's really amazing to me, too, to see how many people are like really enjoying 
to practice with me. And it's so beautiful because, again, they are like all over the world because most of them I met in Montezuma. And for them, it's like, oh, let's practice with Dagma. And they get a little bit of jungle vibes and Montezuma vibes, you know, and they know the place. And I do it from my home. And um, so and I have people in Europe. I have people in America and Canada. I have a woman from Chile who's joining me, you know, so it's so exciting to see that now we have this opportunity to bring things online. And I do special events. I have a musician from Australia who lives in Germany and she um, plays guitar and sings mantra. Her name is Kirbano. And we started a year ago to create special yin yoga sessions where basically I'm teaching the yin and she chants mantra and plays live. And it's really like yin yoga with a live music concert online i have a dj who's based in israel we connected and we do like once a month sound journey where basically people have bluetooth headphones on and they move through the sequence and he composes the music into the class so it's not just like pre-recorded music so i'm really excited about offering special events and like do stuff online and um Cool. That's and, awesome to hear. Thank you. Yeah. And then I have a mentorship program that I've been running four years now. And this is going to be the fifth time. It's called Spark Your Life. And it's coming again the end of January. And that's basically uh, came out of the, the idea of bringing like a, a retreat experience to people at home. Because I would notice people would come to the retreats and be so excited to like continue the practice and be inspired with all the others tools that they wanted to integrate into life and then life happens and boom the first thing that goes out of the window of course is the yoga practice and so I created this five-week program where every week has yoga videos and um, vinyasa videos and yin yoga practices handouts journaling prompts and other tools and um, we meet on zoom once once a week and basically, it's a group coaching program and really looking at like, well, what is blocking me from really living an authentic life? So where's the spark? What's the spark that's missing? And again, like community is so important to me. And I really enjoy this program, too, because so much transformation happens when we come together. And even if it's online, but it's actually really helpful to do it while you are in your daily life rhythm. And it's so easy to go on a retreat to Ibiza in this beautiful place and feel great. But can you bring that into your home? And uh, so it's been a really amazing experience too, to help people to actually really integrate these practices into their home and to see everybody, you know, what are the struggles? What are the little wins and, you know, the community that builds. So this is something that's coming again, end of January, 2022 for the fifth time. Wow. That's amazing. I'm curious, were you doing much like work online prior to the pandemic? No. <laughs> I mean, I was doing this online course, the Spark Your Live. It was called Cultivating Intuition back then. But that was pretty much it. I was not teaching online. I had a lot of videos on YouTube and people were knowing me from these videos. So those are things that I did, but not at all like I'm doing now. But yeah, but then I had to, right? <laughs> All right, yoga teachers, we're just taking a quick break from the podcast so I can share with you this awesome little magical elixir that I love called Magic Mind. They're our sponsor today, and that is pretty perfect because I've been drinking Magic Mind as I've been working on this podcast episode. Magic Mind is the world's first productivity drink that not only gives you the alertness that coffee and other energy drinks do, but also has ingredients to support memory, increase creativity, and boost focus. It contains minimal caffeine and the caffeine it does have comes from the matcha tea. It also has all natural ingredients, adaptogens to help decrease stress and nootropics to boost blood flow and cognition. I love that it helps me with my brain fog, but doesn't give me that jitters and crashes the way that coffee does. Since having a baby, my mind has been all over the place and that's why I love starting my day with Magic Mind. 
If you are looking for more productivity in your life without the jitters that coffee and energy drinks can give you, then I would definitely recommend checking out Magic Mind. I actually have a special offer for my listeners from my friends at Magic Mind. All you have to do is go to magicmind.co forward slash yoga and use my discount code yoga at the checkout to get 20% off your first order. With Magic Mind's money back guarantee, any first purchase will be refunded, no questions asked if it doesn't meet your expectations. I'm confident it will though. So head on over to magicmind.co forward slash yoga and use the discount code yoga to get 20% off. All right, now back to the episode. And one thing we kind of skipped over with your story that I just love to kind of talk about just briefly would be just what it was like, like running a yoga studio in Costa Rica during the pandemic. Cause I feel like, you know, Costa Rica is obviously this very, you know, thriving tourist destination in normal times, but having borders shut down and, you know, flights canceled and people being told not to travel and stuff obviously hits a business that relies heavily on tourists coming through in a pretty big way. Like what was that kind of whole situation like for you? It was intense because I remember in January, like we, we heard the first time about, you know, this virus and in China and we watched the news and we were like, Oh, what's, this and look at these people and you know and it felt so far away and then we had still tourists and bookings and then really literally within like I don't know three four days in March it was like okay now everybody has to leave they're going to close the borders and whoever was there was like okay we need to get out here and there was this panic and then everybody left and from one day to another borders were shut down business was closed and uh and Costa Rica was very strict in the beginning because they right away even taped off the beaches. So like <laughs> you couldn't even go to the beach. There was red tape. And if you would sneak to the beach because you're local, you know where to go, they would find you and like basically patrol the beaches and be like, you can't be here. So right away, zero business. Uh, and so for me, it was like, okay, I'll just go right away on Zoom. And uh, first I did it by donation because I also wasn't really familiar with Zoom and the whole technique. and. Uh, I didn't have airports, you know, airports or anything to use technically, and you can't buy that here, right? So it was really interesting. But yeah, but actually it was really amazing. I have to say, I mean, of course the town suffered because a lot of businesses had a really, really hard time. I feel very fortunate that I could go online and that I have built this international community that, you know, was happy actually that they finally could take classes with me that they normally only can do in Montezuma, right? And um, there was something really magical about the whole place being closed down too. And now it's it's actually back even more than before. It's a bit scary, to be honest, because now it's like we're packed and you know, there's more yoga than ever and more people everywhere and more traffic and everything. So interesting times. I'm actually... I mean, I love teaching public classes, but I'm actually also really happy to see, you know, what happens next and where it's going to take me. And I really do fear it's time for a break because things have changed so much. Like, I I mean, Montezuma is still a small town, but if I go just to Santa Teresa, which is half an hour from here, and it became like such a big place, it's like going to the city. And 20 years ago, we would go to the beach and there were 20 people on the beach surfing and we'd be like, 20 people on the beach? What's going on? You know, so... <laughs> like, is there an event in town? What's happening? Exactly. <laughs> you know, so watching all these, like, it's almost too much right now. And, you know, and the the vibe also is changing. Like, people are very, like, demanding and, like, and I feel like this is a good time to step back and let some other people do their business and, like, I don't know. I mean, I still love when I teach a public class and I'm sure like the last day in December that I'm going to be teaching, I'm going to be crying because, you know, it's going to be sad to like not have a space, but it's fine, you know, and I'm really, really curious where it's going to take me and what what's going to call me because I think growth is never comfortable. I was so you know, we would rather stick to something and we make all these compromises like I've been doing the last two years. Now I realize that, you know, now I realize how much I was trying to like 
you know, fit in or make it work when things actually weren't really fully working anymore, you know, and we are so scared of that. And the moment you jump, the moment I made that decision, I made it public, right away there's a sense of liberation. And now when I walk by the old place, honestly, it feels like it doesn't even touch me anymore. I'm surprised. I thought like I would come back and I would like, I would just break down and no. So, you know, we, we humans are also amazing because we're like holding on, holding on, holding on, trying to make something work until really like something comes and takes it from us or like we really realize. And then we make the jump and we get to the other side and we look back and we're like, oh, actually it feels kind of good here and liberating and free and nice, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think it's uh, it's interesting to hear kind of like, just obviously things being shut down and things being very like closed in Costa Rica and then things opening back up. And in, I mean, Costa Rica has been one of the more open countries, especially on the North American side of, of the globe that you can get to and that type of thing. So I'm not surprised to hear that it's busier than ever because living in Mexico, I feel like that's been very much the same thing. I was living in Puerto Vallarta on the West Coast for a good chunk of 2021 and they had they just continued high season. It was like high season went through normal high season and then they had a second high season. And it's like, you know, how can this be happening when there's this like crazy (laughs) situation happening in the world? And I was just back in Puerto Vallarta for a couple of weeks over American Thanksgiving. And it was insane to see how much busier it was uh, than it was like, you know, when I was just there in like the spring and summertime, I was just like, man, this is just so wild. There's so many people that are here right now. So I can definitely relate to that and and definitely feel you on that. And it sounds like, you know, just being able to walk by that space and kind of just feel that, that closure is, I think, just really a sign that, you know, the time is complete with that space and in that area and that, you know, there's lots of great things that are on the horizon for you. And I think that obviously the situation with the pandemic has been really crappy in a lot of ways, but I think being able to like develop a business online is like a pretty, a pretty cool silver lining of it. Um, I work with a yoga studio that's in the Canadian Rockies. So in a tourist town and so sort of same, same, but different to Montezuma where it's like lots of people are coming and going. So we have this clientele that's like all over the world and we'd never even considered offering online classes to connect with these people. And it's been so cool to have clients, like you were saying, like in Europe and in the US and, you know, across Canada and that type of thing. And I think that that's, you know, kind of a a gift out of this sort of overall crappy situation. Definitely. I feel in a way, this whole situation is a gift because I feel for a lot of us, we really shifted our priorities and we really put things into practice. And, you know, with the yoga too, I feel like we don't really need to learn more. And what we really need to do is really put what we know into practice. And for me, I feel this whole change that I've just been going through was really, really much easier because of 20 years of my practice. And I have friends that were like looking at me and they were like, my goodness, you move with like speed and are you not super sad and are you not grieving? And yes, I am. But I feel also because of my yoga practice, I can so much easier like accept or I see the signs that maybe somebody else would have not recognized so easily, you know, and I'm very, very grateful because that's the yoga to me. And for all of us right now, and with all the separation that's going on, I just want to say like, you know, that's the yoga. Can we hold space for each other? Can we, you know, allow to have different opinions? Can we, you know, really have compassion and just, you know, hold space for each other because, you know, we can't do this alone and we don't know where we're all going, but like community is more important than ever. And the certain flexibility to adapt to the changes is also something, you know, we've been talking in yoga. It's like, okay, how fast can you bounce back if life throws you a challenge like are you really gonna you know use your tools to come back to the center and that that I feel is really the yoga more than anything else right now to like okay I'm challenged can I you know can I stop the resistance can I go back can I like check in with myself what do I need who can 
help me? Like, how do I find my resilience? How do I get back to my strength? Like, how do I feel when I do yoga? I feel better. So then I make it a priority to go to yoga. Or I feel better if I go watch the sunset or go for a walk in the mountains. You know, it's like, these are the questions so many more people are asking themselves right now. And it's coming back to the simple things because we don't need to consume more or add on more stuff. It's like really, you know, use what you have and and find the people that are your tribe and connect with those people. And this is how we're going to move through this, I think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I really love that. So thanks for sharing that. And on that note, I'd love to hear if you've got any other you know, business lessons or lessons in general that you've learned through your career, through, you know, running a yoga studio over the last 20 years and any of that good stuff? <laughs> well, you know, it's it's like finding your tribe for sure and really focusing on the good things and adding more of the good stuff. You know, it's so easy to look at the things that we didn't achieve or the failures or what could have been better instead of really appreciating the people we have in our life that support us and everything that we have created. And then to really look at like, okay, these are the things that are working. How can I add more of that into my life? You know, and instead of like, yeah, thinking of like, what do I need to let go? Because letting go is so much harder than adding on more of the good stuff. Right. So that's a little bit of philosophy of me. It's like bringing more good people, bringing more good connections and, uh, into my life and more opportunities come up like this and really focus on like, yeah, really being in alignment. And like, if, if things are not in alignment with me, can I have the courage to say no? And can I set that boundary? To me, that really was the biggest journey. And I'm kind of proud of myself for like realizing that now with the new space and, you know, and, and, yeah, and bringing myself back to, okay, this is not an alignment and I will, you know, something else will come and I trust. And I know, you know, if you're open and you walk through life and you look at the signs, the universe always has your back in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that those are all really beautiful lessons. And I think that, you know, definitely trusting is super, super hard, but I think that it's, one of like the biggest things that our yoga practice, like you said, can teach us. And I think when we tune into that, I think that's when, you know, we can really get in touch with what we're supposed to be doing in this world and in this lifetime and that type of thing. And it can be so easy to hold on to things maybe longer than we need to, but trusting that everything's going to work out as it's meant to. And I also love the tip about, or, you know, the, the lesson about community. Cause I think that that's one thing that I think a lot of us have really recognized over the last two years of, you know, these government mandates that have asked us to separate from people is how important having a community in some capacity is for us as humans. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. How you say it. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. Is there anything else that you want to share? Anything else you've learned through your career? Well, I think we pretty much covered it all. I think, uh, yeah, it's crazy how time flies. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. No, I think we've gone through all the important things. And uh, yeah, I, I don't have anything to add, I think. Amazing. And can you share with listeners where they can go to learn more about you, where they can learn more about your business, maybe join you for an online class, all of that good stuff? Yes. Um, the best place would be my website, which is dagmarspremberg.com. Uh, there's links to my uh, Zoom classes. There's I also have a monthly membership with an on-demand library. Um, they can find me on Instagram under Montezuma Yoga, Montezuma with Z. Um, and yeah, basically on Instagram, there's also the link tree then that has always like actual things, links to things that I'm offering. And on Facebook, I have a Facebook group that is called Spark Your Life, where I'm sharing inspiration. So those are like the three main things. I still have a website for the yoga in Costa Rica, which is montezumayoga.com. And people are welcome to look at that. But, uh, you know, since I'm not teaching many more public classes as of January, that website will be a little 
neglected after. <laughs> I also teach, I actually also offer private retreats here at our space. We have a beautiful loft that my boyfriend built on like a container base. And we have started already before the pandemic to offer private retreats where people can come for four days or five days and basically stay with us. And they get like a private session every day. And my boyfriend makes breakfast and then, you know, they get a massage and it's just a tiny little package. And, uh, you know, if anybody's interested in that, you can also find that on my website under private retreats Costa Rica. And then I have a retreat in Sardinia, Italy, um, planned for October 2022. That's also on my website. And then, of course, Spark Your Life. Thank you. Yeah, you've got so much great stuff going on. So lots of lots of places for people to follow along and check you out. And yeah, thank you for this conversation and for just sharing, you know, your journey over the last 20 years and whatnot. It sounds like it's been a really beautiful, beautiful ride. And I'm excited to follow along and see what's next for you. Thank you so much. And it's so nice that you're like so close in a way because Mexico, Costa Rica, there has been this like connection like people from Costa Rica would do their visa runs in Mexico and Mexican people would come here so I hope maybe one day we'll even meet in person that would be lovely (laughs) yeah that would be so awesome I would love that okay thank you for this beautiful interview I loved your questions and I love your podcast oh thank you so much and thank you so much for your time today All right, friends, I hope that you enjoyed that episode of the podcast and learned a lot from Dagmar's story and all the change and transition that she's gone through over the last little while, as well as just the journey she's gone through of running a business in Costa Rica for so long. And I know for me personally, I'm excited to see what's on the horizon for her and all the new things that she's going to do in the yoga space. I know that whatever she creates will be incredible. So we'll all be staying tuned for that. I know that for sure. And a huge thank you to Offering Tree for sponsoring this episode. Make sure you go check them out, offeringtree.com forward slash MBO. If you are not sure if they're right for you, you can send them an email, support at offeringtree.com, ask any questions you have, all of that good stuff. And of course, a huge thank you to you for listening to this episode of the show. I couldn't do it without you. All right, that's all from me, and I will see you next week. Bye for now. Thank you so much for tuning in for this episode of the podcast. To find links, notes, resources, and everything mentioned in today and all episodes of the show, you can head on over to mbomyoga.com. You can find the podcast and myself on Facebook and social media at Mastering the Business of Yoga. And I would love for you to join the private Facebook community, Yoga Business Badasses. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please make sure you reach out to me at info at mbomyoga.com. And last of all, if you enjoyed this episode of the show, please make sure you hit subscribe and leave a review for the podcast. It would mean the world. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next week. Namaste. Namaste.